Imagine two astronauts chilling together on the ISS, end of their shift, long day, quite tired of the lab, the absence of gravity, and spending six months straight with that stranger he barely knows in the same small capsule, but now it's dinner time. One of them starts making jokes about the other one's hair looking like spiky cabbage when it's floating around, and the other one answers, well, at least I know how to change a hard drive without triggering the fire alarm. And here we go. <laughs> Anyway, if that little story was to happen in any place on Earth, it would be pretty straightforward. Like, it will probably end with a call to the cops, and whoever started the fight will be subject to whatever country's law is applicable here. But in space, it's not really the same. Not only there's no police, but there's not even a country or a law system to answer to. So what's the standard? And not even for people, actually, for countries or organizations. Again, on Earth, it's pretty straightforward. You can't put your troops past that line or else it's a war declaration. You cannot test your missiles above my airspace. You cannot bring one of your companies to mine or to operate in this area without following a certain set of rules and without paying taxes to that government. But again, in space, there are no real borders or territories, so who do you answer to? Are there even rules that you have to follow? And most importantly, who even sets space law? Obviously, the answer is yes, there are laws, there are rules, quite a lot of them, in fact. But as we will see during the video, it's not always very easy to define them, and even harder to enforce them. When the Cold War started in the 50s, it became clear that some big changes were happening in the world. Nuclear missiles crossing space to reach their destination, Soviets sending the Sputnik 1 satellite in orbit and around Earth, including over the American territory, but above all, people. People are now going to space traveling through space, going to the moon and planting their own flags there. And since the situation keeps getting more and more intense with time, everyone agrees that we need rules, we need laws to regulate what's happening in space and to make sure it doesn't get out of hand. One of the first set of rules that really impacts space activities is the Partial Test Ban Treaty in the early 60s or the PTBT. Basically, it tries to prevent nuclear capacity countries from launching their nuclear missiles for testing in any place other than underground. So that includes anything in open air, anything below water, but also in space. You need to realize that at the time, it was definitely becoming an option to launch your missile and blow it in space, which basically means sharing a big radioactive shower with half of the planet. I mean, I say it's an option, but not even actually. The Americans and the Soviets did this type of test in practice in the early 60s, and some of the electromagnetic pulses measured were so much bigger than anticipated that even the instruments set for the test went completely off scale. In Hawaii, for example, located 1.5 thousand kilometers away from a specific test location, hundreds of street lights started going off, house alarms got triggered, and even some telephone lines completely died by the testing. It just gives you a feel of how much impact this type of testing was, even if you're located at hundreds of kilometers in altitude. So the idea of a treaty to control and regulate this type of activity was not very hard to sell. A long, long list of countries accepted, including the Americans and Soviets, and the formal stamp was put in 1963. After that, all countries respected the treaties very strictly, and nuclear missiles started to progressively disappear from... Yeah, no, I'm joking. Um, obviously, it didn't happen, and the nuclear missile testing increased the decade following those treaties rather than decreased, by some of the countries that didn't sign the treaty, like China and France, for example, but also underground tests happening by the Americans and the Soviets were not as safe as initially planned. But it's not a complete loss, though. I mean, the PTBT was used as one of the pillars of a more complete, wider set of space laws that was decided later, the Outer Space Treaties. But before getting into the details of the Outer Space Treaties, let me just quickly introduce the main actor here, the UNOSA. United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, basically the office responsible for coordinating all discussions related to space law, even today. So they were the main stakeholder and the main responsible for the outer space treaties to be issued. And these treaties today serve as the actual basis or the reference point when it comes to any space regulation, really. So I'll try to quickly summarize what the Outer Space Treaties cover, without getting too much in detail. I mean, even preparing for this video, reading low text is really not fun. But anyway, I'd like you at the same time to keep an eye on how realistic or how precise you believe those laws are. The exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries, irrespective of their degree of economic or scientific development, and shall be the province of all mankind. Outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be free for exploration and use by all states without discrimination of any kind. 
Now, if you're a bit like me, you can already start to feel that the backbone is a bit shaky. I mean, defining in the interests of all countries is a bit vague, in my opinion. And also, it's very difficult to enforce. I mean, how do you perceive that something is not in the interests of all countries or not? Outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. In other words, you can't just go to the moon, plant your flag up there and consider it to be your territory from now on. No national ownership. States parties to the treaty undertake not to place in orbit around the Earth any objects carrying nuclear weapons or any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction, install such weapons on celestial bodies or station such weapons in outer space in any other manner. This is the no nukes in orbit law and obviously it was a very very big point of discussion for the outer space treaties and it was reasonably efficient when you think about it because officially right now we don't have any nuclear warheads orbiting the planet and just waiting to get launched from there. States parties to the treaty shall bear international responsibility for national activities in outer space including the moon and other celestial bodies whether such activities are carried on by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities. All states are liable for damage caused by their space objects. Pretty straightforward this time, I mean, basically it's about making sure that your guys are not doing something that you're unaware of in space, and it also really motivated many countries around the globe to start drafting their own national space policies, applicable for governmental organizations, but even for companies wanting to play the space game. The moon and other celestial bodies shall be used by all states parties to the treaty exclusively for peaceful purposes. The establishment of military bases, installations and fortifications, the testing of any type of weapons and the conduct of military maneuvers on celestial bodies shall be forbidden. The use of military personnel for scientific research or for any other peaceful purposes shall not be prohibited. This one is also quite sensitive. The definition of peaceful purpose here looks nice at the first glance. I mean, basically, don't shoot each other and don't put legions from your army on the moon. But when you start asking some questions, you can start to see the cracks forming. So I can't put a military base on the moon, but what if I send some of my scientists to do some research and they get supported by a few soldiers? This is a peaceful purpose, right? By the way, I'm worried about the security of my guys up there, so I give them a few weapons, just a formality. This is still a peaceful purpose though, I mean, I'm just worried about the protection of my guys. Oh wait, my competitors now got started by the fact that I have soldiers and weapons up there and they built a similar station very close to me. I'm starting to get really worried about my guys, so I'm gonna increase the number of weapons they have. Just for protection, of course. Anyway, you can see how this goes, and it starts to get even more complicated when you start thinking about moon or asteroid mining. Having some military personnel around research stations is one thing, but having them around mines worth trillions of dollars is a completely different game. Now, in addition to those outer space treaties, you know, in the late 60s started to draft other pieces of space law to try and reinforce what the treaties were covering. The registration and liability conventions in the 70s, for example, drafted clearer laws on how nations should keep their space objects and activities well registered. Basically, it also clarifies how a nation is considered responsible if their space object does any kind of damage whatsoever. Basically, keep your guys in check. Also, let's not forget about the initial question we raised about the astronauts caught up in a bar fight. So in 1998, all the ISS participating countries, USA, Russia, Canada, Japan and Europe, signed together the ISS agreement. It basically covers the fact that NASA is considered the lead when it comes to anything related to the ISS and they make the high level decisions, but it also considers that the legislation applicable to an action happening on the ISS depends on where it happened. So basically, if you did a crime in the Russian module, you are subject to Russian law. If you did it in the Japanese module, Japanese law, etc. So basically, plan your punching wisely. Now, as you can see, the space game is regulated by agreed international laws. Basically, any country that wants to pursue any space activity has to follow these regulations, even if they're sometimes a bit vague. But do they? I mean, even better, what if you could write the space laws yourself? I have said previously that the outer space treaties, for example, were written by UNOSA, basically the UN, but in reality, those laws are the result of very long and complicated negotiations between different nations with different interests. And even after the negotiations are done, well, you don't even need to sign the paper. A good example for this would be the Moon Treaty in 1984. So basically, after the outer space treaties, they were trying to clarify some of the elements related to mining resources on the Moon or on other celestial objects, and also to clarify the concept of common ownership by all mankind. 
So you're the US, USSR, China, or basically any country with ambitious moon plans. What do you do when the UN comes with this new set of space laws? You don't want to have restrictions when it comes to mining resources on the moon. You certainly don't want to share the entire moon with all mankind. I mean, the answer is quite simple. You just don't sign it. Only 18 states ended up signing the Moon Treaty in 1984, and most of them were not really main space race contenders, which basically means that today the Moon Treaty is considered effectively useless in international law. Now imagine you already have very ambitious plans for the Moon, you're also the main space runner right now, and you have plans to go there not only to explore but also to mine this time, to mine a lot. On top of that, you also have a lot of political influence, and you have managed to convince many countries to come participate to these ambitious moon plans with you, but they have to sign a certain number of rules, drafted by none other than yourself. Congratulations, you have just invented the Artemis Accords. So I'll dedicate a full video to the Artemis Accords later, but what you need to understand right now is that for the Artemis program, the US did not only heavily invest in a new rocket, a new capsule, and a new crew of astronauts, but they also invested a lot in partnerships. And those partnerships have to abide by certain rules. The Accords for Partners are a key part of the plan and are quite a new format of space law right now. They cover many things that the Outer Space Treaties covered previously with slightly more details to them. So for example, the uh, sharing of scientific information collected during the mission or uh, debris mitigation overall, and even the creation of safety zones to prevent countries from interfering with each other. But ultimately, they are written by the US and with US interests in mind, which means their influence expands every time a new partner signs the accords and accepts them. Funny enough, if you look at a map of all the countries that signed the accords, it looks oddly similar to a map of all US allies in the world. So you can guess how happy US rivals are with this plan. In fact, Russia and China have very openly expressed their dissatisfaction with the Artemis Accords, and their main response is agreeing together to push much further the Chinese program called the International Lunar Research Station, or the ILRS. Again, I will dedicate a full video to that program later on. Anyway, I hope you have learned something new today. I tried to give a very high level view of what space law today covers approximately. I mean, it's also very difficult to not be boring when you're talking about low related stuff. But yeah, I hope it achieved the purpose. Also, let me know if you have other comments related to the space industry in general, or if you have questions that you wish a full video to be dedicated to. And I'll see you next time.